Good evening, everyone. We are still seeing some people pop in. Um, so we'll just get get started gently while everyone files in. Um, welcome to the 40th annual Act Show Awards. We are so happy to see all of your smiling faces here tonight. Um, I am Hillary Pittenger. I am the president of Act Show, and I am super excited to share with you um, our wonderful keynote and some updates from folks from King County Heritage, um, as well as all of our award winners tonight. Um, a reminder, um, there will be an opportunity for award winners to speak um, over the course of the evening. Um, so please stay muted unless you are one of the award winners who is speaking so we can make sure to hear them as best as we can. Um, I also wanna start off tonight um, with acknowledging that we are on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Muckleshoot, Squamish, Puyallup, Duwamish, and Snoqualmie peoples who have been its caretakers since time immemorial. Um, and all of our institutions and places where we do of our work are also on those homelands. Uh, I wanna thank our sponsor tonight uh, for Culture, uh, which sponsors pretty much everything that ACTCHO does, including especially the awards. Um, we are really grateful for all of their assistance and we'll be hearing from them a little bit later tonight. Um, and I also want to uh, extend a thank you to all of our elected officials who are joining us tonight, including um, Attorney General Bob Ferguson and Representative Jamila Taylor from the 30th District. We are really grateful for their support of heritage work in King County. So a little bit about what ACTCHO does. Um, some of you may not be familiar with us. Some of us may get our emails constantly and be very familiar with what we do. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick little review of the sorts of things that ACTCHO does and why we are presenting the awards tonight. Um, ACTCHO stands for the Association of King County Heritage or Historical Organizations, and we work on behalf of all the workers and organizations in the history and heritage fields in King County, which includes museums, archives, heritage gardens, uh, genealogical societies, digital repositories, tribal cultural departments, historic preservationists, independent historians, culture bearers, and history doers of all backgrounds. Um, Today has been a pretty difficult news cycle, and sometimes it's hard to keep doing heritage work in the face of tragedies, large and small. Um, those of us who do heritage work are not isolated from the pain in our families and communities, and we all got into this work to make a difference. Um, we know it can be demoralizing to constantly be confronted by the ugliness and pain that's in the world, and to feel like your work isn't big enough or isn't immediate enough to help with some of these problems. Um, I hope that if that is where you are coming to us from tonight, uh, that we can offer a glimmer of hope. Uh, we know it is heritage work and history work that provides the foundation for activists, educators, and politicians, academics, and organizers to do their work. Uh, even though our individual work might not make the headlines, um, the work that is done by award winners tonight and everyone else who actually represents is the work that keeps traditional knowledge alive. It's the work that saves the stories that will speak truth to power. And it's the work that will, to paraphrase, give people the knowledge that will help set them free. So ACTCHO is really proud to support all the heritage workers in our county, and our mission is to ensure that they have every possible resource and tool at their disposal to do with this essential foundational work of history. We do that in three specific ways. One is advocating. We do advocacy with organizations and individuals. Um, both officials and other civic leaders to support public projects, legislation, and other practices that will create an equitable and sustainable heritage field uh, through things like these awards, through our uh, email blasts that alert people to advocacy opportunities, and through more private behind the scenes networking work. Uh, we do professional development. We do programs, workshops, and tours that share best practices in all aspects of local history work, and we connect organizations with curated lists of state, regional, and national professional development opportunities. Uh, we also provide resources to uh, the organizations in our network. We serve as a centralized resource for uh, 
all different heritage and historic organizations, as well as a connection between them. Uh, we help to lessen the workload on organizations by doing the legwork of researching grant opportunities and helping to find quality research um, and good toolkits to help them better serve their audience, their workers, and the broader community. We do this work uh, as a group of volunteers. We are an all volunteer working board. Um, and I want to introduce our board members that are here tonight. Uh, Dylan High is our vice president. Uh, Virginia Wright is our treasurer. Alicia Barnes is our recording secretary. Maggie Case is our corresponding secretary. Shelby Allman is our social media officer. Caitlin Oye Kuhn is our brand new board member. Uh, and I want to give a special thank you to our outgoing board president, Alan St Alice Stenstrom, who led WACCHO for many, many years and is going on to finer pastures elsewhere in the country. And we will miss her and her leadership very much. If you want to keep up with ACTO and the things that we are doing, uh, please subscribe to the Heritage Advisor, which is our bi-monthly newsletter, um, as well as follow us on Facebook for updates about all sorts of things going on in King County Heritage, um, as well as finding out more about our upcoming programs. And uh, please consider becoming an ACTO member. We have uh, membership fees for individuals and organizations of all different sizes. Um, and it is through these membership fees and the support of For Culture that we are able to continue doing this work. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Sarah Steen, who is coming to us from the King County Historic Preservation Program. And she is going to share a little bit about what that program has been up to. Uh, take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Hillary, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm just going to do a very fast five minute highlight reel of what our uh, program has been working on and what we hope to do in the future. So we are about halfway through our year and winding down, uh, knock on wood, of COVID. And so we're getting ready to start doing in-person meetings again. Well, we kicked off the year kind of learning from what we, uh, employing what we learned from COVID, which started with our John D. Spellman Awards for preservation work throughout the county, really exceptional projects that we've been um, working with or seen happen around the county. And that involved the Vashon Theater, for Legacy Business, uh, Volition Brewing for Adaptive Reuse, St. Edward's Lodge for the partnership that uh, enabled the rehabilitation of, of that lodge uh, in, in Kenmore, and Laura Lee Hudson, who was recognized for her volunteer service as an archeologist over the past decades throughout the county. Uh, we also um, successfully uh, designated the Vasa Hall in Upper Preston, which is one of those uh, small vernacular community halls. It started as a Swedish community hall that, um, is increasingly rare in the landscape. And so we were really honored to be able to um, work with them and include them in our list of, of landmarks throughout the county. And we also were able to work on a number of landmarks or potential historic buildings that, that um, we've really had our eye on for a long time. And so we took advantage of, of the slowdown during COVID to develop landmark nominations for places like Camp Kilworth, which is a Boy Scout camp in Federal Way. It's gonna be Federal Way's first landmark. So that one's coming up in July. Uh, we're looking at the Seattle Tacoma Pet Cemetery this week for a landmark nomination for that. And the Enumclaw Municipal Building, which is a really remarkable neoclassical building in Enumclaw uh, that is slated to come forward too. So we have a, a bunch of exciting nominations um, on the deck. Uh, but we also have other projects like on our designated landmarks, like the Auburn Post Office, which has been, the city has been endeavoring for a number of years to, to really transform that building into the Auburn Arts and Culture Center. And I really wanna draw attention to the really exceptional work that they've done and they're, they're kind of heading into the, the home stretch now. So we're really looking forward to seeing how that turns out and having access to that building soon. Um, another thing that we've been working on that, that we uh, will be rolling out soon is really our strategic planning effort, which really concentrates what, um, what we're gonna be focusing on in the next five years. And we've, we've put together really our highlight um, the, the areas that we really need to focus our attention. Uh, we recognize that community outreach is a big one that we can really improve upon. We wanna um, create more personal relationships in the community and get out there and do things like a window workshop that we held at Neely last summer that we're gonna be doing again this year, other workshops out at Mukai on Vashon. So we're gonna be concentrating on really getting out into communi communities and meeting people 
and making those relationships possible so we can move forward and really recognize the landscapes that we have around us. Um, also, public access to materials, we want to improve um, how everyone can reach what we have, what we already do know, and then contribute to that knowledge. So we're looking at, at different ways to get uh, like story maps out, different interpretive materials, ways to introduce people to preservation and historic landscapes in a way that they might not have before. So we're really trying to, to branch out both virtually and in person uh, to reach more people in our community to, to alert them to what they have available through our preservation program and also centering equity and social justice. We've been working on a number of projects with uh, the Four Culture Group Beyond Integrity to really have those um, necessary conversations about how preservation is going to move forward and recognize cultural significance on par with building integrity to, to consider what the importance of a, of a building is in a community as on par with how historic it might look. So we need to really reform how we assess our, our landscape and what the significance of those elements are. Um, and then also doing things like a project that we've been working on for a year and we continue called Correcting the Record. It's where we go back and look at landmark nominations that haven't um, captured the whole story of the people that were involved in the significant communities that, that played a part and to add those back in to re replace the ones, the people who are missing in those stories. And we've been pretty successful at getting three of them finished and we're looking at three more moving forward. Um, this is really necessary because those landmark nominations can really form the basis of, of interpretation of how word gets out about buildings. We need to really make sure that, that the stories are known and they're documented within, within our records that we have. Um, and so that's an ongoing effort. We're also finishing up the mid-century modern MPD, which many of you have probably heard me talk about because I've been shopping it pretty relentlessly around the county, and that's to recognize post-war uh, buildings, specifically between about 18 or 1950 to the 1970s, and yes, we're getting that far ahead. Um, at all the design trends that happened the post-war, the, the styles, materials, which we have a lot of in King County, especially on the east side, there's huge neighborhoods that are all mid-century modern, and we're really trying to, uh, to introduce people to those styles and bring them to light so people recognize the historical importance of them. And we're also really looking at, at areas of cultural landscapes. We're kind of expanding the idea of significance beyond the built environment and look at, at how landscapes themselves can contribute to our broader knowledge of what we're surrounded by and what's important here and how to capture both those the, the quiet ethnographic landscapes that you can't see and how to reflect history that has been disappeared one way or another. And so that's what we're really looking at, how, how we can expand the idea of preservation generally. Um, but I've, I always welcome the input that I get from ACTRO members, and we're always interested in having that conversation with you all around the county because you can show us things that we can't see. So I look forward to working with many of you in the future. Um, and that's all for what we have right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up, I want to introduce Chieko Phillips uh, from uh, For Culture Heritage, who is going to talk a little bit about what's going on in that program. Yes, hello. Um, thank you to the Board of Act Show. And oops, I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. Um, so sorry if I'm cutting out, but um, thank you to the Board of Act Show and the awards committee for their work tonight. I can't believe it's been 40 years uh, of the award ceremony. Um, and I'm so happy to be here celebrating the resilience and accomplishments of the King County um, Heritage Field. Uh, and I extend a heartfelt congratulations from our executive director, Brian Carter, um, and all the staff here at For Culture. Um, <clears throat> so these awards are for the amazing work that you all have done uh, for our county in 2021. Uh, and for the same calendar year, For Culture has just released our annual report. Uh, which you can find on our website. Just some light reading uh, about what we have. Oh, look at that, Dylan. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, so you can find information about our annual report on our, uh, on our website, uh, which uh, you can get to through the link that Dylan placed in the chat. Uh, so 2021 was definitely a year of recovery, um, one of many that uh, we still don't know the, the total number. Um, but for culture, a lot of our staff, our um, great staff lift was really on our opera recovery program, um, which we are getting closer and closer to be able, being able to pay out um, all those funds. So thank you so much to everyone um, for your patience with us um, as we built that program 
um, and are continuing to work with the county, the slow wheels of the county on um, getting that money out. Please don't ever hesitate to email um, about uh, that if you have questions about your award um, for that program. Uh, and I wanted to share just a few uh, of our regular grant programs that we have back up and running for this year, uh, which will, um, which are the collections care. Our collections care grant is back up. It's been paused for the last two years. It will have a deadline of August 10th, 2022. Um, and that is for our material culture collections that are held in the public trust in King County. Um, our building for equity programs are running this year. We have the facilities program, which will have a deadline in July 29th, and the capacity building program. So to build capacity for those who maybe have a capital project that's on the horizon, um, but you might need um, or be interested in building some support in order to have a more successful maybe capital campaign um, in the future. And that deadline is in September, September 9th. Um, we will also have another sustained support deadline. Yes, this will be the third year in a row that you will have to apply for this program. Um, so please mark it on your calendars. October 12th um, is the deadline for that. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight two of our field services programs, um, one of which is still in a pilot phase. It's a general professional development support program. It's a stipend program for both individuals and organizations that are in the heritage field. Um, that can be used as up to $1,500. It can be used um, on any professional development opportunity. It could be for yourself. It could be for your board or for your um, a group of staff uh, to bring someone in, do a training or capacity building. Um, that is an open deadline. Um, it's uh, rolling, so there's no set deadline. Um, and then also we will be running our heritage internship program again in the fall. We'll open up a call for uh, pro, uh, project proposals from the heritage field um, that we will then um, we will select and then uh, place interns uh, from various uh, academic programs at those sites to help with those projects. So please keep those in mind uh, and be sure that you're signed up for our newsletter, uh, which you can get access to from the link in the chat um, so that you can be the most up to date with uh, the information about our open programs at ProCulture. Thank you. Thank you, Chieko, uh, and thank for Coulter for all of their support of all the organizations that are here tonight. Uh, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, John Falk. Uh, John is the executive director for the of the Institute for Learning Innovation in Portland. Um, he's an author and researcher and has devoted his professional life to understanding informal and free choice learning from the visitor's perspective and helping educational institutions, including museums, zoos, and aquaria, uh, measure and meet the needs of their audiences to follow their curiosity into becoming happier, healthier, and better informed individuals and members of their communities. He has come to share some of his insights with us tonight, and we are so pleased to have him. Welcome, John. Thank you so much, Hillary. And let me share my screen. Um, and since I can't chew gum and talk at the same time, I'll wait till I get that up. So um, I'm going to talk. Oops, I'm not going to. Let's go back. Uh, back, 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 back. There we go. So. Um, so first of all, thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Dylan, and um, initially Michael King for inviting me to um, speak to Act Show tonight. And although I'm going to focus on museums, because that's what I know the most about, uh, I hope um, that what I have to say is equally applicable to those of you who are working in other aspects of heritage, um, uh, but I'll let you be the judges, judge of that. And um, so <clears throat> historically, um, people have defined the value of museums and similar kinds of organizations um, based on their tangible assets like collections and buildings, or for that matter, objects um, landscapes. Um, 
However, these days, the meaning of museums, the value of museums primarily resides in its intangible assets, the experiences that the public has and uh, through interaction with those buildings, those objects, those landscapes. Um, and so a few years ago, I set out to see to what extent I could try and understand the nature of that value. And in fact, redefine the nature of that value and ultimately measure, quantify that value. Um, so that's a daunting task. So how do you go about measuring and defining intangible experiences? Um, how do you begin to define this type of value? And I, I hope that everybody else doesn't have this, um, Let's see if I can figure out how to get this thing out of the way. There you go. Um, at least for me, that's helpful. Um, so um, the answer to that question turns out to be, um, now this doesn't seem to be working, oh God. Ah, there we go. So how do you begin to get to that answer? The, the question is ultimately, I would argue, that you, if you really want to know how um, the public itself values the experiences that you create, um, you have to ask the visitors themselves that question and not um, people like curators and directors and um, educators or academics. Uh, wish I wish I could figure out how to get rid of that completely. Um, turns out the good news, if I can get this to work, the good news that over the past 40, 50 years, dozens of researchers, including people like me, have interviewed thousands, if not tens of thousands of people about their museum experiences. And so what have they found out? Well, the good news is virtually all could readily talk about their experiences. And the amazing thing is they could talk about that whether that visit occurred days before or decades earlier. Um, also good news is most people's memories were quite positive. Um, I don't consider this bad news, but it's a little um, disconcerting that typically what people remember and talk about is actually quite varied and, and often typically very idiosyncratic. So um, you talk to 10 people about what they remember about an experience walking through the exact same exhibit, they're likely to tell you 10 different things. Um, and of course, people have, these researchers have chosen to categorize and try and slice and dice these findings in lots of different ways. But I would make the case that the single most striking and non-trivial aspect of all these findings um, and the key to understanding the value of museum experiences is the durability and salience of these memories. The fact that people can remember these experiences, again, whether they visited a museum a day ago, 10 years ago, or even 50 years ago, people can tell you what they did. Um, so the question then becomes why, why are museum experiences so memorable? And what does this mean? Um, well, the first thing we need to know based on brain research is that this is really unusual. So first of all, people only remember the tiniest fraction of what's happened in their life. Um, most of the things that happened in your life yesterday, you don't remember. Certainly most of the things that happened in your life a week ago, you don't remember. A month ago, a year ago, let alone 40 or 50 years ago. Um, 
typically we only remember things that we consider to be meaningful. And by meaningful, what we mean is things that impact our lives, that impact our well being. Most of the other stuff is just gone, gone. So if we combine those two facts, fact number one, that virtually everybody who's ever gone to a museum can remember that experience, something about that experience, and tell you about it and remember it. Um, and two, that research suggests that the only things that are highly memorable are things that we perceive as meaningful. Therefore, we can conclude that for some reason, um, people must perceive that these museum experiences must be meaningful, must somehow affect their well being. So that's where I started um, in this quest. And to make sense of this, though, we have to understand what is meant by well being, and in particular, how I'm defining well being. So, a few first principles. First of all, at least as I'm defining well being, it's not really the way people have currently primarily talking about well being, which is primarily as a psychological phenomenon. The term well being has become um, quite au courant these days. Lots of people talk about well being. Um, but the prevailing model is a model that has been created by folks um, called positive psychologists. And well being has become sort of in pop psychology thought of as, as a synonym for happiness. It's about this notion of being fulfilled in your life. The truth is well-being is first and foremost a biological and cultural survival related phenomenon. And yes, um, being happy is an aspect of well-being, but well-being is not about being happy. Um, well-being is much more deeper and profound than that. In fact, I would argue that the ability to perceive well-being evolved as a proxy for fitness. And here I'm talking about um, Charles Darwin's notion of fitness, survival to fitness. Having either biological genetic characteristics or in the case of human cultural characteristics that support our longevity and our long-term survival. Um, the good news is, um, unlike the way, again, well-being is typically talked about um, as this unusual rare thing that if you work really hard, you can attain well-being and life will be good. Um, actually, most people most of the time are in a state of well-being. In fact, all of us are the descendants of people who achieved well-being, otherwise they wouldn't have survived and reproduced. All of our ancestors accomplished well-being at least sufficiently to get along and survive. Um, in fact, every living thing, including bacteria and fungi and oak trees and insects have the ability to perceive and to a degree influence their well-being to try and avoid danger, try to avoid being sick, um, learning to avoid things that put you in a bad situation. Um, and at the same time, every living thing works to enhance their positive well-being, um, figuring out how to find a mate or learning how to hang out with people who are like you and um, think good things about you. Um, Unfortunately, well-being, particularly positive well-being, is always ephemeral. So the pursuit of well-being is a never-ending process. And that's why enter museums. Um, that since this is a never-ending process, we humans have figured out literally tens of thousands of ways to try and enhance our well-being. But the interesting thing is they all have evolved to fall into four basic types. So here they are. 
originating more than 350,000 years ago, um, people derive satisfaction from feeling a sense of purpose. This is the most recently evolved kind of well-being, from being spiritual, creative, um, uh, through um, science, through history, through um, religion. People create a sense of identity, a sense of actualization. Um, and people seek out ways to be curious, to have wonder, interest, to build their identity. I like to comment about the fact that I look out at um, my window here at the beautiful forests in a, um, out in Oregon, the Pacific Northwest. And I get to see deer and wild turkey walking out there in front of me. And um, I get up early in the morning and as I look out at the sunrise, I admire the beauty of the sunrise or I see flowers blooming. Um, but the deer and the turkey that walk by are not particularly impressed by the sunrise or the sunset. They're not particularly impressed by the beauty of the flowers. That's a very human quality. Um, that the ability to perceive beauty, to find curiosity in nature, um, those are uniquely human qualities. And um, we derive a lot of well being from that. Um, but we also derive a lot of well being from something that uh, a lot of other creatures share, particularly our higher ape um, relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas and orangs. Um, and originating more than 5 million years ago was the ability to use our intelligence um, to learn more about our world and control our environment. And, um, and we use the information to predict and influence both our understanding of the past and our understanding of the future. And of course, we go to places like museums for these purposes as well. Um, humans are fundamentally social creatures. Sociality, uh, relationships um, evolved a long, long time ago, as maybe as long as 600 million years ago, there were social creatures. Um, and we spend a lot of our time um, trying to build social relationships with our friends, with our family, with our loved ones. And we also spend a lot of time doing things to garner um, respect and uh, appreciation by those around us, our coworkers, as well as those in our community. And again, museums support those kinds of well being. And then finally, going back to the beginning of uh, the evolution of life itself, um, we also derive well being from our most basic needs hunger, thirst, rest, security, safety, health, and the desire for sex. Um, we derive a lot of well being just from eating a satisfying meal, from getting a good night's sleep. In fact, we spend nearly um, more than half of every day doing things devoted to supporting our physical well-being. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. Psychologists don't spend a lot of time writing about that. But those physical well-being needs are as fundamental to human um, well-being and survival as those more intellectual needs. And in fact, if anything, the events of the last couple of years with COVID only reinforces that um, if people don't feel safe and secure and don't feel like they're going to be healthy um, in a place, they won't go there. Um, so four basic outcomes, all of which um, arguably museum support. So the question is, how do you go about measuring that? Turns out there's some really good data that supports that. It turns out all that data that people have been collecting for 40 years, talking to people about why they go to museums and what the benefits are they get from them can be mined. Um, and although they've historically not been framed in terms of this way, in terms of personal, intellectual, social, and physical well-being, they clearly fall within those categories. And we can use that data to construct instruments 
and ways of asking people that get at whether those outcomes have been achieved. But the other thing that this research suggests that um, memories, um, again, are the key. And the things that we consider most valuable are the things we remember the longest. We might derive a lot of satisfaction from eating an ice cream cone, for example, but I probably won't remember every ice cream cone I ever ate in my life, let alone even maybe the ice cream cone I ate uh, a month ago. Um, and so, uh, as opposed to the way we typically collect data in places like museums, we need to extend that timeline because we need to allow the value of these experiences to emerge. So we need to wait weeks, maybe even months after a visit in order to get valid measures of how valuable those experiences were. So to test this out, I recently did a pilot study and I collected data from um, six different types of institutions from in fact, three different um, countries. Um, Billings Farm is a living history museum in upstate New York. History Nebraska is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a, a state history museum in Nebraska. The Museum of Toronto is actually a virtual museum and they do primarily cultural history programs um, through workshops, things like that. Um, the Museum of Life and Science is a combination science museum, outdoor um, museum. Toronto Zoo is a zoo, obviously. And Herica is a science museum. It's the National Science Museum of Finland. Um, and I collected data from people. And as these numbers suggest, um, on average, um, people were able to say that these institutions supported their well-being and th that well-being lasted not an hour or two, not even a day, but on average, more than a day, in many cases, more than two weeks. Um, of course, different institutions supported different kinds of well-being, not surprisingly, um, institutions um, that attracted a lot of families like the Museum of Life and Science, Toronto Zoo, um, um, were particularly good at supporting social well-being. Um, uh, the, again, the Toronto Zoo was a particularly good at supporting physical well-being as well, um, as was um, in a modest way, all these other um, museums. Um, social well-being was, uh, I mean, intellectual well-being was particularly well supported by the workshops that I tested at the Museum and by the Museum of Life and Science, oops, that, and by, I'm sorry, uh, Billings Farm in History, Nebraska, were particularly good at supporting intellectual well-being. So what does this all mean? What it basically means is that um, museums through the experiences they offer um, actually do support the public's enhanced well-being. And this, I would argue, is the primary value that museums create and deliver. And more importantly, the so what of this is that defining value in this way opens up new ways for museums to describe and measure the public value they create. Because if well-being is a fundamental quality of life, it is not some esoteric outcome. It is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be a healthy society, to create healthy communities. Because fundamentally, every single human in every community is every day trying to find ways to support and enhance their personal, intellectual, social, and physical well being. And so museums can be seen to support this fundamental aspect of a healthy society. But even more important, 
it provides a theoretically sound way to understand that value and to show how museums can really improve the experience they create for the public. So in particular, we can, we can use this framing to think about how can we specifically enhance people's personal well-being by connecting to their identity related needs and motivations. What are people seeking? What are their needs? We can build, we can create experiences to directly connect to those motivations and needs. We can think about creating experience that allow people to feel a sense of ownership and identity with their experiences to co-create their experiences. We can create experience that surprise and delight and create a sense of awe. We can build users' knowledge and interest and empower them to be able to make informed choices and control their lives and control their futures. And by giving people reasons to keep on doing it, we build experiences that keep on giving and keep creating value over and over and over again. We can make it easier for people to do things together with others and to build meaningful relationships that have them say that this was an experience that supported the needs, not just of me, but of those experiences with others I care about and love with my children, with my loved ones. And finally, we can make the experiences that feel comfortable and convenient and make feel, people feel secure and safe. And by doing this, we can create value that is memorable, that is meaningful to people, not just for a day, not just for an hour, but for weeks, months, years, decades. And we can do it in ways that we can talk to our funders and our supporters that provides evidence of the value that we create in our communities. So I will pause there and see if there are any questions or comments about anything that I've said. Feel free if anyone has any questions to type them in the chat or uh, just go ahead and shout it out. There hasn't been a huge rush so far. Well, I want to thank you, John, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I know measuring and evaluation is something that we are constantly talking about as uh, an industry, as a field. and it can be really, really hard to nail down those extremely ephemeral qualities of how do we measure when a good time is actually promoting something positive in our community. Um, and, and it's really nice that there are researchers like you out there who are helping us answer those questions. Great, I see um, there is one question that I'll see if I can give a answer to, not that I have any crystal ball on this, how do you think COVID has changed the museum experience for visitors? Um, well, the short answer is it's too early to know. Um, I will say that what COVID, as I alluded to, certainly did, it um, heightened people's concerns about safety. Um, and I think that um, historically people felt secure going to museums. They felt they were safe places, um, but they rarely thought about them as being safe in terms of uh, safe from uh, infections, safe from pathogens. And I think that um, paranoia about disease and about being in close, um, uh, closely connected with people, um, the challenges of hands-on exhibits, which be, have become traditionally um, the go-to approach for museums, um, but all of a sudden hands-on exhibits come with a, with a downside these days. Um, I think this attitude is going to wane, but um, I, I'm not sure 
that in an age of pandemics, we will ever feel exactly the way we did pre-COVID about that. And so if nothing else, that's going to have an effect on the museums and museum visitors over time. Um, but I think the other way clearly um, that COVID has changed things for all of us is the, the tension between the real and the virtual. And um, <coughs> I think people will continue to have a hunger to be in real spaces and see, see real things. But the threshold for being willing to go to real places, I think is gonna be raised now. And so it's gonna make it more challenging for museums um, to convince people to get off the couch and go to places like museums or historic sites um, than it was in the past. And that's gonna be a challenge for museums. They're gonna to have to deal with that. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you again for joining us tonight. You're very um, welcome. Thank you for providing your contact information. Um, so if folks have uh, future questions and concerns, uh, you can hopefully reach you there. Oh, Dylan. It looks like we do have, sorry, one, one final question from Jamila. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, where is that? It's, I, I didn't want to write it down. This is oh, Representative okay. uh, Jamila Taylor. Um, yeah. And I am very much interested in how your research will drive more um, local leaders to make investments in museums and other places of gathering. Because while I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of folks being concerned about coming together. Um, I also hear that there is a lot of, uh, especially um, younger folks who are looking for ways to gather and gather in unique spaces and, and places. Um, sometimes you have these temporary pop-up museums, temporary exhibits that just drive a lot of energy into a particular area and can boost the economy. Um, and so I'm very curious around how we can use your research to drive innovation and policy at the local level, like smaller cities like Federal Way and sure. Algona, Pacific and Des Moines of getting folks off the couch, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Jamila. Well, I'd like to believe the answer is uh, this new approach, this new way of thinking um, should support that in two ways. Um, the first, as you say, is that I think um, by understanding the core factors that um, motivate people to do whatever they do. Because again, um, obviously what I was measuring was the, were the, were the ways that um, historically museums have supported people's well-being. But the truth is, uh, as I argue, everybody um, spends all their life trying to figure out how to support their well-being. And if we can use that insight to better understand how people who currently don't go to museums um, support their well-being, we can, we can take that information to make um, museum kinds of experience and other public experiences more attractive to um, people who've historically not fully taken advantage of that. We can also uh, use that information to make these experiences even better than they currently are. The other thing that I didn't talk about, but because I am uh, very concerned about ensuring that um, value actually has, has two ways of thinking about it. There's the story one tells, and I've been sort of giving an accounting of the value, but the other, meaning of accounting is thinking of the green visor types and literally um, thinking about how people value things. And to be honest, uh, policymakers, people like yourself, um, who are charged with supporting lots of good works in a community, ultimately the currency you have to give is just that, currency, dollars. Um, you policymakers, funders are 
forced to say, well, of all the good things going on out there, of all the ways that we have supporting the public's well-being, be it museums or healthcare or heritage sites or police um, or garbage collection, um, they all have a price tag to attach to it. So how do we make that judgment? And actually what I was able to do and, and have been able to show is that you can actually monetize the well-being that's created through these kinds of experiences. And I will tell you that the, um, at least in the pilot study, the average value per person of these enhanced well-being was on the order of 400 to $450 per person. And the return on investment was on the order of $200 of value in enhanced well-being for every dollar spent um, to bring that value to bring those experiences to the public. So the other way that I think this research is, has the potential to affect policy is to show that um, not only do museum experiences and comparable kinds of experience generate enhanced well-being, which is a public good, it actually is cost-effective and um, generates significantly more value than it costs to generate it. And in a shameless plug, I'll also say that um, if you want to know more about this, uh, a lot of the details are in this new book of mine called The Value of Museums, Enhancing Societal Well-Being. And um, anybody who's interested in knowing more um, can contact me and I'll be happy to share additional information. But thank you for the good work you do, Jamila, and for asking that question. Thank you again, John. Wonderful talk. And I'm sure you'll have several people checking out your book after this. Um, with that, um, I would love to move into the awards section of the night. Um, we, are, we are here to, to reflect on the wonderful, innovative, and impactful history work that's going on in King County. Um, ACTCHO has given awards for some of that work since 1983. So this is our 40th batch of annual awards. Um, and we are so pleased to be able to celebrate work um, that has been done in the past year to promote equity, justice, civic engagement, and pride of place through history work. Um, we often hear statistics about King County being one of the most diverse counties in the nation, um, having one of the best library systems, most used library systems. Um, we hear great compliments about our county's unique dedication to supporting arts and culture through our public funding model. Um, but here at ACTCHO, we also believe that we have one of the best local heritage communities. Um, and we are so proud to be able to lift up a slate of award winners this year who really exemplify that spirit of dedication and community focused service that really makes our county shine. So first up, um, I will give a brief introduction and then award winners will be invited to speak briefly. Um, no more than three minutes, please, so we can get through everyone. Um, our very first award tonight is the Charles Payton Award for Heritage Advocacy, um, which is awarded to Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson um, for his office's diligent work in stopping the unlawful sale of the National Archives facility in Seattle. Um, not only did this help keep records in our community, um, particularly vital tribal records, um, it also saved the jobs of experienced archivists in our community and all of their institutional knowledge and support that they give to the heritage field. Um, so Bob, if you would like to share a little bit. Uh, Hilary, th th thanks so much. It's great to see you all. And uh, first, you may be wondering what, why I'm talking to you from a car. And, uh, and so I have a good excuse. My 14-year-old my daughter is a fast pitch softball pitcher and uh, she's pitching in a game right right over here and so I'm just taking a break from watching her pitch she's doing great by the way as she usually does to uh, I just never miss one of her games no matter what but I did not want to miss this so thanks for letting me join you from a vehicle and also thanks each and every one of you for your work uh, to preserve the historical legacy of our great region and I know I spent some time on the King County Council I'm very familiar with the organization and many of you who are on this zoom and others as well so I just want to th say thanks and also thanks for your assistance with the lawsuit it's true Hillary we sort of led that effort but it was a team effort in every sense of the word with 
dozens and dozens of declarations and co-plaintiffs and many of you individually and as an organization assisted in all those ways and many others. So really it was just us trying to bring together the community to speak out against what the federal government was doing in moving what is really, as this group knows, I don't need to explain to you, the historic DNA of our region, which is there at the archives. And look, I guess what I'll just say in the few minutes I have is the federal government's, the actions of these of these uh, federal agencies, these boards, I just thought was outrageous. Uh, they weren't listening. They weren't interested in listening. Uh, they didn't care about these records. They didn't care they're going to move them a thousand miles away. They didn't care what we had to say about that or you had to say about that. They just weren't interested, honestly. There were bureaucrats 3,000 miles away who just didn't care. And I just found that infuriating as a Washingtonian, just infuriating. And as a lawyer, it was infuriating because they violated the law while they were doing it. And you've got to have certain processes before you take actions like this. And so uh, it was an honor to work with all of you. It's a shame we had to go to a federal judge to put a stop to it, but we were successful. One thing I will say, just kind of moving forward, Hillary, is what we were successful in doing was stopping the sale of the building. Nothing technically stops the federal government from moving the records and not selling the building. So I want to be clear that we still have a lot of work to do. Write to your members of Congress, right, and tell them to put additional protections on the records. So what we could do was stop the sale of the building. And to be honest, I don't really trust these agencies. We've got more uh, freedom of information requests. We're getting more information all the time. We just got another batch of documents because we're interested in keeping track of this and encourage you to stay involved. And just the last thing I'll say is that, uh, um, you know, uh, my interest in, in the subject really is quite personal. My uh, late father, I'm from a large family, my late father, Murray Ferguson, was intensely interested in uh, the history of the region, uh, just in an amateur sense. He just was a guy who worked at Boeing for 40 years. And uh, he loved, loved the archives. He went there all the time. Where he had time with seven kids, I have no idea, a full-time job, but he was there all the time. And I was talking to my sister today, uh, who works at the Seattle Public Library. Uh, with, and the, she runs the Seattle collection there. And she talked about a story when she came back from graduate school from Indiana, right back in the day when flying home was a big deal. She had been home for months. When dad picked her up at the airport, before going home to see all of her friends and family she hadn't seen for months, he said, hey, we have to swing by the National Archives on the way. I, I got some things I want to check out. So that's how into the National Archives my father was. He passed that love on to me, to be sure, and to all my, my family members. And so really it was an honor to work on something that is just so core to who we are. But again, thanks to each and every one of you for working with us on this case, for being a partner in this case. And beyond that, just all you do for preserving the history and, and the richness of this really, really wonderful community. It's an honor to have this award. I'll treasure it. Thank you so much, everybody. Great to see you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, congratulations. And if there is anything that pops up that Actio can help with again, please reach out and let us know we are on board. It's a deal. Thanks so much. Next up, we have the Virginia Marie Fulkins Award for Outstanding Historical Publication, which this year was awarded to Frank Abe, Tamiko Nomura, Ross Ishikawa, and Matt Sasaki for their incredible graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, Japanese American Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. Uh, this graphic novel holds up the stories of those who fought against the racism and injustice of incarceration and inspires readers to consider the ways they might also reject resist injustice in our own time, all using the powerful format of a graphic novel. So thank you. And I think some of the authors and illustrators would like to speak. Well, thank you, Hillary. I'm Frank Abe. Thank you for this recognition. Uh, plaques on the wall right behind me here. The Falcons Award is especially meaningful to us in that it recognizes outstanding original research. Uh, we did painstaking research to be sure that we created a story that is authentic. Every word and every page is drawn from the history, much of it which took place here in King County, from King Street Station to the Immigration Detention Station on Airport Way to Harborview Hospital. Um, I myself just retired from 25 years in King County government, most recently in the office of King County Executive Dow Constantine, where I can assure you that we truly valued the work of ACCHO. And I realized recently that there was something I learned while working with Dow, Ron Sims, Gary Locke, and Bob Ferguson, by the way, and that was to see from the inside how government can be a force for good for, for people. Uh, in developing the story of We Here by Refuse, though, I now realize that that experience inside King County government helped me to see behind the federal government's actions in World War II to betray Japanese Americans here in King County. 
I want to thank the rest of our creative team of Tomiko, Ross, and Matt. We couldn't have finished this book, however, without the project management of Cassie Chin, Deputy Executive Director of the Wing Week Museum, and our publisher at Chin Music Press, Bruce Rutledge. My thanks to them. Thanks to Akcho. Here's Tomiko. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, it took a village, bookshelves of research, and four years for us to produce this book. And I'm grateful to everyone who helped us along the way, including the family of my uncle, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, who is one of the figures featured in the book. And on another day of unspeakable violence against children, I'm thinking of my niece, dad, and members of my family who were children also during World War II. I hope that no child may be lost to the long arc of history. Thank you so much, Akcho, for this honor. Um, I'm going to pass it to Ross. Uh, thank you, Akcho, and um, for this uh, great honor. And um, I echo everything that uh, Frank and Tomiko said. I want to thank them for their collaboration along with Matt. Um, it was uh, everybody worked hard to make this as good a project as it could be. So um, I really appreciate that teamwork. Um, I'd also like to thank the history keepers across the county and the state and um, and the internet um, for their value, which were they were invaluable resources for this project, particularly the uh, Densho Digital Deposit Repository right here in Seattle. Um, and finally, I would especially like to thank my wife, uh, Edith, and two sons, Zoli and Tomo, for their patience during four years of weekends and evenings of me chained to this desk. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next award is the Heritage Education Award, which this year is awarded to the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe Language Department. Um, they have been awarded specifically for the creation of the Muckleshoot Language Apps and Language Video Program. Um, this is a set of four free apps, which include learning games, a basic dictionary, and a Lushootsi keyboard for mobile devices, along with a video series that encourages language learning through cultural activities and integration into daily life. Uh, this uh, project will increase access to learning tools, uh, language learning tools for all ages on multiple platforms, both within and outside the boundaries of the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe Reservation, in order to forward the goal of revitalizing the Lushoot Seed language through its use and presence in the daily life of tribal members and in the broader community, which is a vital component of decolonization work and the protection and promotion of Indigenous heritage in King County. So I will pass it over to folks from the language program if you would like to share anything. Come on. Hi, good day to all of you. Um, we are very honored uh, to receive the Heritage Education Award. And as a thank you, we have chose to sing a song for you this evening. Ha, ha, cha, 
Thank you so much for the gift of your song and for the incredible work that y'all are doing. Thanks for being here tonight. Our next award is the Long-Term Project Award, uh, which this year was given to the Northwest Railway Museum for the Great Locomotive Swap, which was a 20 year project in partnership with the Northern Railway Foundation in Nevada to trade and transport two locomotive engines, returning each to the state of their original use. Uh, we all know uh, collections work is slow under optimal circumstances and caring for massive objects makes it even slower. So try throwing in a deaccessioning project and a massive transportation puzzle. And I suspect most of us would throw in the towel. Um, but instead, the Northwest Railway Museum completed this project that not only strengthens our own collection and access to Northwest history, but will also provide a template and inspiration for other organizations interested in building partnerships to ensure that local history stays local. Welcome to the Northwest Railway Museum. Thank you very much, Hillary. Um, it's been uh, a really fun uh, project putting this together. It was uh, uh, on again, off again for a number of years due to many complexities. Uh, it's not, these are not the size of artifacts that you call Hollinger metal edge and get a box to put in or even get, uh, um, uh, you know, compact rolling shelving to put one on. Uh, the locomotive we sent off to Nevada was 320,000 pounds and uh, had to be uh, broken into three pieces, uh, taken apart. The wheels were taken off and the uh, locomotive was put on a separate truck from the uh, wheels and motors. And the same with the uh, historically important to King County locomotive that we brought in from long-term storage in, uh, in Kelso Longview. Uh, it was also uh, moved in uh, three pieces and uh, a project that uh, had eye-watering costs and uh, some uh, pretty complicated permitting too. The truck that uh, took this locomotive off to Ely, Nevada was uh, about 250 feet long and uh, required uh, just a, a myriad of permits to allow it to move over the highway system. Thank you so much for the recognition. Really a lot of people were involved in, uh, in putting this together. We're especially grateful to the uh, partnership with the uh, uh, Nevada Northern Railway Foundation, uh, and uh, but also to our uh, many volunteers and staff here at the museum that uh, that supported the project. Thanks so much. Congratulations. Now you just have another train to take care of. <laughs> we'll all look forward to being down and seeing it soon. And maybe another landmark nomination for Sarah Steen for process. <laughs> Our next award is the Excellence in Public Programming Award, which this year uh, is given to Seattle Theater Group, 
um, for their centennial celebration of the Neptune Theater in the University District. Um, this celebration highlighted the importance of theater as part of the University District and as a historic preservation project focused on a third place, a place of gathering and culture building that anchors a community and not just a neighborhood. Uh, we also, uh, they also, I should say, got this information out in front of an audience that might not normally seek out history and historic preservation knowledge, which helps further education about the interdependence of arts, culture, and heritage in our region. Uh, is anyone from a Seattle Theater Group uh, willing to speak on their wonderful project? Yes, hello and thank you. My name is Angela Neubauer. Hi, I'm Dan Reinhardt. And we are staff members at Seattle Theater Group. We are the nonprofit operators of the Paramount, Moore, and Neptune Theaters. We feel so humbled to accept the Excellence in Public Programming Award for our Neptune Theater Centennial Celebration. We felt so fortunate to have this monumental celebration come at a time of need when our doors have been closed for over a year due to the pandemic. It was such a great way for our community to come together and honor this theater that we love and care about so much. The Neptune Theater was originally opened as a movie house back in 1921. STG saved and reopened the theater as a live music venue in September of 2011. Since STG has occupied this space for 10 years, we have hosted over 1,600 public performances and events with over a million people in total attendance. STG's vision is for this to be the people's theater where all are welcomed and represented. This helps guide us in our programming and planning of events. We celebrated the 100th anniversary of the theater in many ways over the course of November last year. The culmination of the celebration was a big event that we threw on November 16th, which was free for the community and over 600 individuals showed up for a night filled with performances, storytelling, and much more. Within the Centennial Project, STG took time to reflect on the history of the building and the fact that we're on Duwamish land. As a way to honor this, we commissioned an art installation by an indigenous and local artist, Joe Seymour. And this art piece is proudly displayed at the entrance of our theater for anybody to enjoy and see the history of the land that we're on. Yeah, I, um, thank you, Angela. Um, and by the way, Angela planned this event, did the heavy lifting on it and did an amazing job at that. Um, and furthermore, I, I just like to add, you know, we've, it, it's turned into a bit of a love affair between STG and the Neptune Theater over the past 10 years. And, um, you know, on our, on our most difficult day, it's still, it, it's still a labor of love, even to this day. And it, it, it always beats working for a living, so. Um, all of us, we truly enjoy it. We're, we're emotional about it. We're, we're dedicated. And uh, we really thank you for this acknowledgement. We found that the celebration and the diverse programming that entailed to really fill our cups with joy and motivation to keep stewarding this historic theater for another hundred years. So thank you again for this wonderful award. And we hope to welcome all of you to the Neptune Theater for a live performance sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next award is the Exhibit Award, um, one of our oldest awards going back to 1983. Um, and this year it is awarded to the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and the Duwamish Longhouse Museum and Cultural Center for their dual exhibit, Spirit Returns 2.0, A Duwamish and Settler Story. Um, this exhibit radically expands and reinterprets the Spirit Returns exhibit that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society opened the Log House Museum with 20 years ago, this time including uh, both modern and historical perspectives of Duwamish people who already resided near Alki when settler colonists arrived in West Seattle, uh, as well as new original research uh, relating to uh, new archival items uh, being included in the exhibit this time. 
uh, the exhibit stretched between the two institutions, uh, so in two different buildings, and was a wonderful example of a true partnership between small heritage organizations and an example of doing the work to listen to the needs of your community and find ways to share resources in a way that uplifts everyone. So anyone from uh, either Duwamish Longhouse or Southwest Seattle ready to chat about their wonderful project? Well, Maggie doesn't want to start. <clears throat> I'm Heidi Bone, and I'll go ahead and start. Um, I thank ACTCHO for offering this award for our exhibit project. Um, I'm, exhibit, uh, I'm accepting this as the curator for the exhibit on behalf of the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center and the Duwamish Tribe, which oversees it. I work closely with Jolene Haas, Executive Director for the Longhouse, who's with us today as well. Uh, and it was through her inspiration and vision of the spirit returns with so many nuanced meanings that we created this joint exhibit. This is now a permanent exhibit at the Longhouse, and I encourage you to come and discover these many layers from the Longhouse itself, which sits on an ancient village site along the Duwamish River, to the return of important tribal objects now on display in our exhibit. During the collaboration between the Longhouse and the Loghouse Museum to revisit this exhibit of 2001, I worked closely with their curator, Maggie Case. COVID restrictions meant we didn't actually get to meet in person until the week before uh, opening, actually, after a year of countless Zoom meetings and emails, which I'm sure all of you can appreciate. Uh, throughout, we were constantly reminded of the parallels between then and now in this relationship. Chief Seattle and his people first greeted the early settlers not far from the Loghouse Museum, and they themselves lived not far from where the Longhouse sits today. The relationship was and is today a friendly support this continues to be evidenced by the great love and support the Duwamish tribe receives from the greater community today. The Spirit Returns exhibit was intended to stimulate thought as we revisited old and new ways of looking at this relationship, and we hope we accomplished that for our visitors. There's still much more to share and learn. This award helps highlight that greater purpose. We thank you for this honor. Um, well, thank you so much to the Awards Committee of ACTRO for this award. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Maggie Case, the Executive Director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I came to this position from the curator role, and it was an honor to serve as the staff lead at the Historical Society on this project. But first and foremost, I want to start off by thanking our partners at the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center, especially Jolene and Heidi, who were our closest collaborators in this exhibit. Spirit Returns 2.0 would have been impossible without you, and it was really an honor to get to work with you. Thank you both so much for your wisdom, support, and creativity as we figured out what a dual hosted exhibit could even look like, went back and forth about our exhibit themes endlessly, and of course your infinite patience as we all navigated curating exhibit in the Zoom era of the pandemic. One of the best parts of this process was getting to work so closely with you as we crafted our vision for what Spirit Returns 2.0 could look like. Of course, I also want to thank our exhibit sponsors as well, For Culture and the City of Seattle Arts and Culture, For Culture and the City of Seattle Arts and Culture. We so appreciate your support of the Historical Society and Spirit Returns 2.0 specifically. Revisiting an exhibition 20 years later is not the kind of opportunity that comes knocking every single day. It was a joy and a challenge and a labor of love to rethink an exhibit that has so defined the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I want to thank B.J. Bullard, the curator of the first Spirit Returns exhibition, as well as the entire board of the Historical Society who was present during the first exhibition in 2001. As curator on our end, I had really big shoes to fill, and I can only hope that I did the legacy of your work justice. I also want to thank the descendants of David Maynard, whose donation of the Maynard letters to the Historical Society were the research base of our half of the exhibit in 2021. And thank historian Phil Hoffman, who is always so generous with his time and expertise when I'm trying to wrap my mind around a new exhibit. Lastly, I want to thank all my friends and partners and volunteers at the Historical Society. Specifically, I'd like to shout out Michael King, who served as the executive director of the Historical Society while this exhibit was being curated, and who developed and conducted a series of oral histories interviews that greatly informed the Historical Society's half of this exhibit. Spirit Returns would not be the same without his expert touch and mentorship. 
I'd also like to thank the board of the Historical Society, especially our president, Kathy Blackwell, for their unwavering support of a new interpretation of a historical narrative that we've been telling for decades and for their excitement about this partnership with the Duwamish Longhouse and thinking about exhibits in general in a new light. On behalf of the whole Southwest Seattle Historical Society team, thank you, Actro, for this award, and thank you, Heidi and Jolene, for the opportunity to collaborate. Thank you both. Congratulations. Our next award is the Technology Award, which this year goes to the AMP, AIDS Memorial Pathway. Um, this is an augmented reality app and public art installation project, which also collected and shared the stories and history of HIV AIDS in our community. Uh, it is both the physical installation, but serves as a repository of these oral histories from a diverse swath of Northwest residents whose lives, families, careers, and communities were impacted by HIV and AIDS. In this time of an ongoing pandemic, the lessons these stories teach us about the dangers of homophobia, racism, and sexism in healthcare feel especially pressing. Uh, this project teaches about a vital and traumatic period of LGBTQ plus history and also sheds light on the groundbreaking medical, social, and artistic work being done in Seattle, which resulted in benefits to the whole world. So thank you uh, to the AMP. Do we have someone uh, ready to speak on this project's behalf? Maybe not. I didn't see anyone pop in, um, but they will certainly. Oh, sorry, Becca, there you are. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, I'm sorry, you may not have heard me. Uh, this is Tom Rasmussen. And as I was saying a little bit uh, a moment ago, we're so honored that uh, we're receiving this award today, the AMP, the AIDS Memorial Pathway. The uh, AMP was created by volunteers and artists in the community to tell the history of AIDS in our region and to memorialize over 8,400 people who died of AIDS in the state of Washington, mostly young gay men in the early days of the, uh, of the epidemic. The AMP also honors those who stepped up to help. We do that through art on the plaza above the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station and at Cal Anderson Park and through the technology of the app and the augmented reality, which you can access with your cell phone. The app links you to recorded stories and community histories. And these are powerful stories and incredible histories of people in our community. And we felt a great press of time to record those stories because uh, AIDS was first identified in this community 40 years ago and people are getting older, people are moving away, people are forgetting and people are dying. You can see the people and hear the names of so many who died of AIDS and who remember through the app. The app and the augmented reality that it contains deepens the understanding and appreciation of the physical artwork. And it includes a digital memorial called the Names Tree, which you can see in the background. It's a beautiful uh, work of art that uh, where the names, when names of people are spoken who died, uh, a lamp will rise up, a light will rise up out of the tree. The app connects visitors with valuable HIV AIDS resources and information, which is so important because there's still no vaccine to protect against HIV, and there's still no cure. I want to thank Julia Biabout and her team at Novabi for developing the app and augmented reality that is being recognized today. We invite you to visit the app, the AIDS Memorial Pathway at the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station, and we invite you to download the app to receive a powerful and artistic experience through augmented reality and a richer understanding of our history of this very difficult time. Thank you so much, Tom. Congratulations to you and to the whole team. All right, our next award tonight is uh, one of our two Willard Jew Memorial Awards. Um, this first award is the Willard Jew Memorial Award for Volunteers, which goes to Kim Turner. Uh, and it is being given to him for his longtime work at the Queen Anne Historical Society. Um, not only uh, has Kim been a longtime resident of Queen Anne, um, 
<laughs> but he also served with the Queen Anne Historical Society Board for 35 years. Um, he gave tours, including a walking tour of Mount Pleasant Cemetery for the last 14 years, which you can see in some of these images. And he has just been a very dedicated volunteer to local history, particularly in the Queen Anne neighborhood. So congratulations to Kim. And would you like to say anything, Kim? Well, if it was a, a team effort. Uh, Isabel Eglin, Bob Frazier, John Hannes, and Del Loader started it back in the 90s. And the first tour was given in 1997. Uh, we've been giving it almost every year since. Uh, one public tour during the summer and a uh, smaller tour given originally to the uh, students from McClure Middle School and then to the students from St. Anne's School. And that's been given in the uh, middle fall, usually late October or early November. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I love the award plaque, thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations, thank you so much for your dedication to local history. And uh, you, you have in enjoyed some rest now after those many years of walking tours. <laughs> well, I'll still be giving it uh, this <laughs> summer, August 20th uh, will be the public tour. I don't know that we're going to have a school tour. Thank well, you. <laughs> you might see some of us signed up for that tour this summer then. Thank you so much, Kim. You bet. Our Willard Jew Memorial Award for staff this year uh, goes to Eugenia Wu, uh, who as so many of you know, barely needs an introduction, is the Director of Preservation Services at Historic Seattle. Uh, she is an architectural and historian so we, 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 and yeah. director of preservation services at Historic Seattle for 13 years. Um, she has also been on the Four Culture Board of Directors since 2020. Uh, she's been on the Four Culture Historic Preservation Advisory Committee, the Governor's Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, and is a co-founder of Dokomomo US WeWa, which is the actual organization with the best name to say, um, and is just an incredible architectural historian advocate. Um, so thank you for all of your incredible service, Eugenia. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here tonight. And thank you to ACTCHO for this honor and congratulations to all the award recipients tonight. I'm in good company, that's for sure. And a shout out to Michael Hershenson for nominating me, thank you. Um, it's hard to believe that I've been at Historic Seattle now for 13 years. It's the longest I've ever had one job and I still love it. There's never a dull moment and every day brings something new. Preservation advocacy is not for the faint at heart. It requires passion, thick skin, perseverance, strategic thinking, and the stamina to play the long game at times. Whenever I have to deal with a particularly difficult issue, I think about my mom's advice. Don't take it personally, let it roll off your back. So I never doubt mom. What I love about advocacy work is the partnerships and collaborations we build along the way. There's nothing like galvanizing to fight for a place that matters to a community. One of the highlights in my career was attending the state Supreme Court proceedings for our effort to advocate for the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Ordinance applicability to the University of Washington. Being in the Temple of Justice in Olympia was awe-inspiring. Preservation law is a foundation for advocacy, so that was a big career defining win. Many of you have contributed in your own ways to advocate to save a historic place. I've worked with quite a few of you and I'm sure we'll continue to work together in the future. It's a cliche, but effective preservation advocacy really takes a village. I wanna encourage you to all to keep up the fight. And because I have a captive audience, I wanted to share with you the latest big advocacy effort in King County. The Des Moines Masonic Home is threatened with demolition. This is an amazing resource, not just in Des Moines and South King County, but in the state. There's a June 2nd deadline to submit comments to the city of Des Moines about this issue. There will be other opportunities to participate, but this one is com that's coming up is important. 
I paste, uh, let's see, I'm gonna paste it in the chat. So hopefully it's there. Um, and we're working with the uh, Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, which is leading the effort. And we're working with King County Historic Preservation Program for Culture, Des Moines Historical Society, and many others. And definitely look for a now and then article from Clay Eels um, coming up in a few weeks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And yes, we will also be sending out updates on how you can help advocate for that project and any others that Eugenia is working on because we will go where she, she leads. Our next award is a board award, um, which is going to Victoria Stiles. Uh, Vicki Stiles is awarded the ACTO Board Award for her 29 plus years of service as the executive director of the Shoreline Historical Museum. Uh, she has overseen the Shoreline Historical Museum through many years and projects, um, both at its historical first home, uh, then leading the organization through a complete move to a new location in 2011 and the opening of a new collections and research facility in 2021. Um, she also served on the actual board and has been an advocate for local history, especially in North King County, for decades. So congratulations, Vicki. Well, thank you very much, Hillary. I uh, am so honored to have my life work acknowledged by ACCHO, and I really thank you very much for this award. <laughs> um, and uh, I have to say, though, that um, Everything that I did, I didn't do alone. <laughs> I am surrounded tonight at a party here at the Shoreline Historical Museum by my friends, board members, volunteers, um, people who have seen all of these projects through thick and thin and um, without them, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. So um, it's really, really wonderful to have them here. And I also thank For Culture, who just stood by the museum through some of the toughest times, and our King County Council members, all the way back to Larry Phillips and Carolyn Edmonds, Bob Ferguson, congratulations, Bob, for your award, and um, Rod Dembowski, who's our current King County Council member who has just been a wonderful, wonderful uh, supporter of heritage and of the museum. And I, I really appreciate the award. And um, uh, I also appreciate what John Falk had to say because I think he identified why I ended up um, being in this field. A uh, visit to the Burke Museum when I was about eight years old uh, sealed my fate. And um, I have wanted to work in museums ever since then. And how lucky uh, I've been to be a part of ACTCHO and a part of the Shoreline Historical Museum for over half of my life. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you again for your wonderful service. Thank you. We have a second board award this year, uh, which was a surprise that we were able to pull off because it is for Pat Filer, who has organized this entire situation that we are in tonight. So the rest of the board had to find a way to keep it secret from her for as long as possible. Um, Pat has been the director of the Log House Museum, the program manager for culture and education director at History Link. And uh, in terms of how I know her personally, has been an actual board member and for over 20 years has been the chair of the actual awards committee organizing this important piece of our annual programming and our advocacy on behalf of organizations throughout King County. Um, Pat asked me earlier if I needed pictures of her and I said, no, I found some. Um, 
And when I think of Pat, this image of her weightlifting is exactly what I think of. She is someone who will absolutely take the weight and she will do the work that is thankless. She will do the behind the scenes work um, and she will keep up all of that and keep that weight on her shoulders and look incredible doing it. Um, so thank you so much, Pat, for your many years of service to ACTCHO and to the entire King County Heritage community. Oh, you're muted, Pat. We want to hear you talk. Hey. I am still smiling at that picture. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is such a nice surprise, you guys. And mm -hmm. thank you so much to the board of directors for acknowledging this milestone of 20 years tonight. It's been an interesting and motivating 20 years. Motivating because it's just so great to continue to see the unique and respectful projects and personal contributions that continue to be made by people in our community, despite the many ups and downs and challenging times for heritage organizations. Uh, in the past two decades, I've been a part of acknowledging so many wonderful projects. Um, I've, been I've been part of acknowledging newcomers to our field, as well as our veterans, such as Walt Crowley, Lorraine McConaughey, Quintar Taylor, Tom Keita, Cecile Hansen of exhibits examining time told stories of first peoples of this land and those who settled it, and as well as unique stories. Bruce Lee, Jimi Hendrix, a Vashon Island veteran saved letters and photos, items left at the Statue of Liberty on Alki Beach, internment of Japanese Americans. And I've celebrated events. 100th anniversary memorial cruise of the Steamer Dicks, civil rights tours, haunted history tours, the restoration of a B-29, the opening of the Duwamish Longhouse, the New Burke Nordic Heritage, and the Wooden Center for Wooden Boats, Seattle Centennial, and the 50th anniversary of the Seattle Black Panthers. Heritage education projects with Jack Straw, students from Rainier. Rainier Valley High School, Renton Historical, uh, Renton High School, Lake Washington School District, and the Museology Program of the University of Washington. It's all enriched our history content in our schools. Publications from the History Link Gang, David Berge, Barbara Nielsen, Paul, Paul Dorpat, David Williams and his mom, Jackie. They've packed our libraries and projects, preservation of the Cadillac Hotel, the Panama Hotel, and that switcheroo of two train engines. Wow, how cool is that? The list goes on and on and on. And as you can see, it's been very diverse and wonderful. So check out the list on our Octo website. Now, each year it becomes a challenge. Can our team come up with a list of recipients that either will top or mirror the previous year's and each year it just happens. Look at this year's recipients. Our heritage is indeed rich and resourceful and committed. Now this odyssey could not have happened as we have all said without a team. And if my friends and uh, colleagues are still here. I'd like to introduce them to you. Alan Stein, my History Link colleague that's been on the committee for 15 years and with History Link since its inception. Alan knows everybody. So it was a no brainer for him to be on the committee. And plus, I think I might have threatened him one time or another. Plus he married my oldest son and his wife, believe it or not. Barbara Nelson, 90 years old. She was on the committee even before me, 22 years. Most charming and interesting person you'll ever know. She knows everybody too. She sends written comments for each meeting that she cannot attend now that her kids have taken her driver's license away. Dee and Walt Carroll, both avid volunteers from the Sammamish Historical Society. Dee, 16 years, and her husband, Walt, 13 years with the committee. And I must tell you, there's never a dull moment with these guys. Karen Metter, super volunteer from the South End. She did an in-depth research project on Military Road in the Neely Mash and just loves her. She's been on the committee for 12 years. And I must admit, we did wine tasting for the events. 
for this um, award events, both before and sometimes during the event. Michael Hershenson, who joined us after receiving the Charles Payton Award for his work with Folk Bike Festival, Queen Anne Historical Society, Historic Seattle, you name it. 11 years he's been on this committee. And Michael always lends a calm and fair voice of reason and is the ultimate tiebreaker. Bob Federley, tenure member, very involved with Fashion Island. We manned the flowers and name tag station for many, many years. And he takes time to attend our meetings virtually when he's at spring training. Alicia Barnes and Hillary Pittenger, three years. The, they're actual board members and now hold important, and each hold important roles in their own respective organizations. And they are now holding the reins of the OCTO Award spent. Thanks to, that's 118 years of volunteer work, you guys. Thanks to these guys. I could not and would not have done this all these years without them. We had fun, but took our responsibility very seriously each and every single year. Plus, it gave me another way to just continue to be a part of this vibrant Heritage King County group. I still plan to help by identifying potential award recipients and submit to the them to the committee. You didn't think after 20 years I could go cold turkey, did you? Anyway, thanks again once and to all of you. I'm so proud to be a part of this Heritage community and count you among my friends. And now I'm going to take my shiny new plaque and head on home. Thanks to everybody and congratulations to all my co-recipients. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for all your hard work. We have one more award tonight, uh, which is our Board Legacy Award. Um, and this year that has gone to Paul Dorpat. Um, this has been awarded to him this year for donating his lifetime collection of historical research, books, publications, and local ephemera relating to Seattle's past to the Seattle Public Library. He, of course, is the author of so many books on the history of Seattle, um, the author of the Now and Then column in the Seattle Times, and a co-founder of History Link, among many other uh, journalism and history credits to his name. Um, and now he is contributing all of that lifetime of work to the rest of us uh, to be able to access and use as we continue our projects and work in the uh, heritage of King County sector. Uh, Pat has, or sorry, Paul has prepared a video uh, for us to enjoy of, of uh, his acceptance speech. Um, and uh, we would love to play that for you so he can share his words with you all. First of all, I want to say to my peers, it's uh, an honor, of course, to be recognized for their work and my work, the work we share, and thank all of you also for your work and preservation of our regional and local history. Um, my donation to the public library surprised me the size of it when I started to go through all the stuff in the basement. Uh, <laughs> oh and a lot of stuff and uh, when it gets organized it'll be quite useful to people I think and uh, I'm sure there some of you will be helping with that I hope you will well anyway uh, what, what it really represents is my belief which I learned from my my uh, high school principal, what he called Vox Populi. He was a man of considerable uh, personality and uh, also erudite and verbosity. Uh, his belief in Vox Populi, which is to preserve our history, and, uh, and the, which is the voice of the people you know, to a large extent. Uh, of course, I'm grateful that these materials will, will eventually uh, wind up uh, free of charge 
and that's the way I intended it. That's why I gave it to the to uh, with those stipulations. Uh, I I want to hope that this kind of donation will become commonplace, and that you and yours will consider searching into your attics and basements and stuff and look for the stuff that will be useful to not only you to recall, but for use to the city and to uh, preserve its history. Um, so please contribute your own photos and, uh, and anything else that relates to displaying or exhibiting our, our history. So once again, did I say I think originally, I think I've already, already told you thank you, I'll say it again, thanks much, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that we'll have a lot of fun going through some of this stuff. And all the other stuff you guys contribute, uh, there's so much more to contribute and get from you all, so go for it, please. Thanks very much, and bye-bye once again, thank you, thank you, thank you, bye-bye. Congratulations to Pat and congratulations to all of our award winners tonight. You all do incredible work. We are so glad to be able to recognize that work, celebrate you and give you a chance to really show off and show a plaque uh, that, that proves that you are doing exactly the incredible work that you say you are doing every single day. Um, a big thanks to John Falk for his keynote. Uh, thanks to Sarah and Chieko for updating us on King County Heritage Initiatives. And thank you everyone tonight uh, for appearing, uh, for supporting ACTO, for supporting uh, our member organizations and for supporting King County Heritage. We couldn't do it without you. And we are so excited about what'll happen this next year that we'll be able to give awards for in 2023. So thank you all have a wonderful night.